interesting to, to be here as a Haverford man. I understand there are Episcopal graduates in the room, um, and, and, and that just makes it tough to speak, so I'll, I'll go as slowly as I can. <laughs> Uh, it, it, is, uh, it is an extraordinary pl privilege to, to be now in my fifth year as headmaster of the Haverford School. Um, we had a tough, uh, a tough fall, and, and, and uh, some of you may have heard, uh, for the first time in my five years, we lost in football to the Episcopal Academy. Quick moment of silence for that, please. Uh, and and uh, even worse, we lost the famed spit, split sweater uh, that is the primary icon of the Haverford School. Uh, it, it now hangs at, uh, at the Newtown Square campus for the first time. Uh, we did win it nine years in a row, so perhaps it was time. But uh, just, just uh, I've decreed no smiling, no laughter at campus until it returns in November. So, so, so you know, bear, bear, bear with me on that. Um, great, great to be a part of this community now for five years, and I hope for many years to come. My sort of claim to fame in the, the uh, point of my talk today is going to be a little bit of a tour of American national security challenges, uh, threats, and opportunities. And, and I'm, I'm going to start, if I can, with a, a war that, uh, as, I, as I look around the room, I think pretty much everybody in the room remembers, uh, which was Operation Desert Storm uh, uh, in 1990 and 1991. Uh, it was my first war. It was a great little war. I'd attended... Um, I attended Creighton Prep, a Jesuit prep school in Omaha, Nebraska, and from there went to West Point, and from West Point went to Oxford, and um, because we all make sacrifices for national security, and, and came out of Oxford and um, almost immediately was deployed to Operation uh, initially Desert Shield and then Operation Desert Storm. And as Austin mentioned, I had the, the great privilege of leading a tank platoon, uh, 15 soldiers plus me, four M1, A1 Abrams tanks and, and uh, part of the famed 1st Cavalry Division. Uh, and, and during that war, we were, we were part of the famed left hook the, that swung around the Iraqi army and took it from behind. We claim the distinction of moving farther faster than any unit ever has in the history of warfare uh, as part of that 100 hours of ground combat. Uh, and and uh, as part of that uh, operation, we took the Iraqi army, we were part of the effort that took the Iraqi army from the fourth largest in the world to the second largest in Iraq. In, in, uh, in, in that 100 hours. And, and um, reflecting on that experience after, after that, that first war I'd fought, after studying war at West Point and at Oxford, um, and, and also reflecting on the other events that had happened about the same time, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, uh, the, 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 the end of what I'd expected to be a lifetime of job security uh, with, with the collapse of our greatest enemy, uh, I, I thought hard about what this all meant for uh, the future of tank warfare, what I'd expected to be my lifelong career, um, and, and the future of combat in general. And so after Desert Storm, when the Army decided to send me back to Oxford to get my PhD, because some of us make really grave sacrifices for national security, uh, I decided to look not at the kind of war I just fought, war of tank on tank, plane on plane, so-called conventional warfare, although in fact that is the least conventional form of warfare. That isn't the way wars are usually fought. Wars are not usually fought by uniformed armies clashing against each other on a defined field of battle. Usually at least one side is irregulars, insurgents, terrorists, people who don't wear uniforms and don't fight by the rules. And so when I went back to Oxford, I decided not to write about the kind of war I just fought, but about the kind of war I thought we were going to fight in the future, wars of insurgency and terror. Right? And so if you're doing that at Oxford University, you have to read the words of T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, uh, who, who attended St. John's College, Oxford, my, my first college at Oxford, and, and who led a band of Arab guerrillas against a conventional, uh, in his case, uh, conventional Western, in his case, Turkish army during the First World War. And Lawrence of Arabia actually felt sorry for the Turks he was fighting against. In his book, Seven Pillars of Wisdom, T. Lawrence said, for, for, for them, 
we were uh, a mist, a vapor. We would rise up out of the sand, congeal, strike, and dissolve back into the sand. They were a blind boxer. They could kill us if they could only find us. For them, waging war on rebellion was messy and slow, like eating soup with a knife. I read that phrase, I said, this is true. I was, I was in the bathtub, I'd been for a run on, on Oxford's Port Meadow, and I'm in the tub reading Seven Pillars of Wisdom, eating strawberries, and, and drinking champagne. Because it's Oxford, right? That's what you do, right? That's what you do. And I, I, it was literally a eureka moment for me. I came out of the bathtub, and I said, eureka, it's true. Uh, I found it, I have the title of my dissertation. And my wife said, that's nice, honey. Go put your clothes on. <laughs> so I did. And so I had my title, Learning to Eat Soup with a Knife, right? And that's, that's like seven words down. Uh, and and, and 99,993 to go. And, and to fill out those 99,993 words, I decided to look at two cases where Western armies had struggled to fight against insurgents like Lawrence. Right? And so I looked at the case of the British Army in Malaya and the American army in Vietnam. The Brits fought a counterinsurgency campaign in, in Malaya, what we today call Malaysia, from 1948 to 1960. And they started badly. Western armies tend to start badly when they're fighting insurgents because that's not what they're designed to do. They're designed to fight other armies, right? But the Brits are smart, they adapted, they learned, and they ultimately defeated their communist insurgent enemies in what's today widely viewed to be the classic case of successful Western counterinsurgency in the 20th century. And it only took them 12 years, right? So when Lawrence said messy and slow, he wasn't kidding, right? And I compared that case with the American army in Vietnam. Do I have any Vietnam vets in the room? Got some of the right generation, but uh, uh, no. So, so um, I just have to be a little more careful if I do. So uh, um, in Vietnam, uh, the United States also, uh, an, uh, an army that, that had been designed for conventional combat, fresh off our, our victory in World War II, uh, and a tie in, in, in Korea, but a, an army designed to fight other armies found itself having to fight an enemy who, who waged war from the shadows, an insurgent army of, of terrorists. And, and uh, although the American army also adapted to this kind of war that it had to fight, a kind of war for which it had not been prepared, it didn't learn fast enough, and, 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 and we lost. And if a great power loses a small war, and for the United States, Vietnam was a small war, right? uh, if, if, if a great power loses a small war, it does so for only one reason. Right? It, it's not gonna run out of tanks, it's not gonna run out of soldiers, it's not gonna run out of airplanes. If, if a great power loses a small war, it's gonna be because it runs out of national will. It decides it's not worth the price to win. Right? And that's what happened in Vietnam with extraordinary costs for the people of South Vietnam, uh, who, who, who suffered enormously in the years that follows. The boat people, uh, have, 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 uh, many of, of whom have, have uh, exceeded beyond, beyond any reasonable expectations uh, when they made their way here to the United States. Um, but but uh, um, the, the people of South Vietnam suffered horribly. The whole region uh, suffered. The Khmer Rouge came to power in Cambodia, largely as a result of our failings in, in, in Vietnam and, and Pol Pot in the killing fields. Uh, so millions of people dead. Uh, and, and, and also enormous damage to the United States and in particular to the U.S. Army, which arguably still has not recovered from the trauma of losing the Vietnam War. Right? And, and so I argued in, in, in my doctoral dissertation, uh, which became the book Learning to Eat Soup with a Knife, that, that um, nations needed to be able to learn how to adapt to the demands of counterinsurgency. And, and, uh, and I also argued that insurgency was more likely to be the kind of war the United States was going to face going forward. This was in the wake of Desert Storm uh, than, than con the conventional combat I just fought. Right? And the good news is I was right. And the bad news is I was right. Right? And, and so, um, I, I uh, finished, finished my dissertation at Oxford and uh, tried to get it published. And, and the two best presses in my field were, were, were in our Princeton and Cornell. They both have very good security studies programs. And uh, I, I sent uh, the, the manuscript off to, to Princeton and to Cornell. And uh, they were not interested. 
and if I, I can't remember now which I've got the, the letter somewhere in the basement, but one of the two of them wrote back to me and said, Noggle, Dr. Noggle, which sounded really good, Dr. Noggle, uh, you write well. Uh, for, for your next book, perhaps you should choose a topic that has some more contemporary relevance. And then September 11th happened, and suddenly people were interested in insurgency, right? And I was finally able to get the book published. And, and when I did, I am, am proud to be able to, to tell you with absolute certainty that it was the best book on counterinsurgency written by an American in the decade of the 1990s. And I am absolutely confident when I tell you that because, of course, it was the only book <laughs> on counterinsurgency <laughs> written by an American in the 1990s. And, and Newt Gingrich, uh, God bless him, actually said that on, on, on Fox News. Uh, he, he, didn't, he, he didn't say the only, but he said, Noggle's book is abs without a doubt the best book written on counterinsurgency. So we put that on the cover of the paperback. Uh, and, and so uh, I'd written a book on, on counterinsurgency, and we were suddenly interested in the subject again. Now, I'm, I'm, I've been a, a, a teacher, a professor, as, as uh, Austin mentioned. I had some kids uh, in my office just yesterday talking about these very topics. And so I continue to teach uh, and mentor, not as much as I'd like to. Usually I'm, I'm talking to parents, but, but you know, it comes, <laughs> comes with the job. It's a little bit of a high demand, uh, a little bit of a high maintenance uh, crowd, honestly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> looking, not looking at anybody in particular here. Oh, oh my God! Right? Oh my God! But 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 so 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 we're off the record here, right? He says he says to the cameras. Uh, so, uh, but but when I teach, what I tell the, the, my students, what I tell the kids is is do the research first, and then write. Right, and I think most of us would agree that that's probably a pretty good, pretty good way to go about this sort of business. They never do that. But well, 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 sadly, neither did I. Right, so so I did it the opposite direction. So having written a book, and in fact the best book on counterinsurgency, uh, in the fall of 2003, I got to go off and actually experience counterinsurgency for the first time in Al Anbar, Iraq. Uh, and and let me start off, but before I before I tell that story, let me start off by saying that the invasion of Iraq in 2003 was unnecessary. Uh, as well as unbelievably poorly conducted. Uh, a guy named Tom Ricks, who, who uh, worked for me uh, later in his book, Fiasco, uh, which I thought was gentle and kind, uh, uh, about the invasion, about the decision to invade Iraq and, and the uh, um, operation to invade Iraq, said uh, the first line of the book, Fiasco, is the American invasion of Iraq in the fall of 2003 may well turn out to be the most profligate, profligate act ever committed by any nation in the history of man. So, I'm about talking about you know, saying, saying what you really believe. So, and we can, we can obviously come back to that in, in questions if you'd like to discuss it more. But so, uh, having invaded Iraq unnecessarily and badly, uh, an insurgency erupted uh, almost immediately as, as me and others had predicted it would. We were completely unprepared for that insurgency. And so this is literally true. Uh, the tank battalion, of which I was now a, uh, an operations officer, sort of third in command, uh, was, was preparing for combat. We were in a, a, a million dollar exercise, uh, probably multi-million dollar exercise, preparing to, we were about to launch our tank battalion into the flank of an enemy tank brigade that had decided to attack, uh, uh, decided to attack the U.S. Army in frontal combat, like there was anybody on the planet who could have done that in 2003, right, or would have been stupid enough to do so, right? Uh, and, and, and we're, we're, we're at, 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 at it's showtime, right? We've been building up to this for weeks, and we get a, a no joy, ceasefire, stop your operation, right? Let uh, all officers report to classified briefing area when we were told that we were, prepared, we were, we were being sent to Iraq to fight an insurgency, right? We, we were a tank battalion. We knew what an insurgency was only because I'd written a book on insurgency, but, but we had never trained for insurgency. We, had, we hadn't written an insurgency doctrinal manual, a counterinsurgency doctrinal manual since 1975. We were clueless and useless. And uh, nonetheless, we were sent. Um, we were sent with, uh, we were only allowed to take uh, one company of our tanks, our, our other two uh, tank companies reconfigured. Uh, and, and got Humvees, uh, and the Humvees didn't have any armor on them, and so they had roughly the ballistic protection of the back of one of these chairs, which 
Um, actually, that's not true. This chair had a lot more ballistic protection. We literally had canvas. So the ballistic, this blazer has more ballistic protection than, than, than what we had going into, uh, into Al Anbar, Iraq. And we were sent to a town named Chaldea, uh, which, which you probably haven't heard of, but it's between two towns you may have heard of, uh, Ramadi, the provincial capital of, uh, of Al Anbar, Iraq's Wild West, and a pretty little town named Fallujah, right? Uh, and the folks who were too mean for Fallujah got sent to Chaldea. Uh, and uh, and um, uh, we we got uh, uh, I'm not going to say we got our asses kicked, but but we 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 fought our asses off. Uh, there were about uh, um, there were about sixty thousand people in our sector, clustered on the the, the town of, of Chaldea. Of those sixty thousand, as near as we could tell, about three hundred, about one half of one percent, were actively devoted to killing me and my guys. About 300 folks, right? They were armed with AK-47s, with improvised explosive devices, um, dressed in, 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 dressed like this. Um, I mean, not exactly, no cashmere, but, but you, 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 you take my point. They were not uniformed. Uh, they, they did not have body armor. They did not have tanks. They did not have artillery. They did not have close air support. They did not have naval gunfire. If they had stood in formation to fight us, and it might have taken them two, well, it might have taken us two minutes, Maybe three, right? Which is why, of course, they didn't fight us that way, right? They waged war in the shadows. They hid among the civilian population. Over the course of our year in Al Anbar, we took well over 600 insurgents off the battlefield, either killed or captured. Uh, and, and at the end of our year in Al Anbar, there were more of them than there had been when we started. We were literally going backwards in our war. We lost 22 dead. Uh, 150 Purple Hearts across my battalion of about 650. Um, Valorous Unit Award. Um, and we were, we were by no means any closer to pacifying and creating a, a, to pacifying the, our, our sector and creating a stable civilian government than we had been when we started. When we got back to Fort Riley, Kansas, one of my captains made up coffee mugs that said Iraq 2003-2004. We were winning when I left. Right? Uh, we weren't, obviously, and we knew it. I went from Al Anbar almost directly to the E-ring of the Pentagon, where I became the military assistant to Deputy Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz. It is extraordinarily dispiriting to go from, from out in the field to corporate headquarters, believing that corporate, or, you know it doesn't make any sense out in the field, but you assume that somebody somewhere knows what's going on. And, and, and getting back to the, the, the puzzle palace of the Pentagon and finding out that they didn't have a goddamn clue. And, and so um, I set to work trying to um, fix that. Uh, and, and I found that uh, um, uh, the Pentagon was a way tougher place to fight than Al Anbar had been, right? At, at least in Iraq, I had some idea who my enemies were. Uh, but uh, I was, was helped by my friends and my allies, as we so often are in life. Uh, a captain named David Petraeus had been one of my teachers at West Point. And uh, Dave was, was by now uh, a three-star and uh, was put in charge of the Army's doctrine writing and the Army's preparation for combat. And, and so when he came to visit uh, Secretary Wolfowitz, I grabbed uh, the, the good general uh, and, and said, hey, general, we need to write a new instruction book for how to fight the wars we're currently fighting. We haven't done it for literally a quarter of a century. And Petraeus said, hey, John, that's a really good idea. Why don't you get started on that? And he was a three-star, and I was a lieutenant colonel, so I did, because that's how it works in the Army. And uh, over the course of the next 13 months, we produced the Army's first counterinsurgency manual uh, in a quarter of a century, and obviously the Army's best counterinsurgency manual <laughs> in a quarter of a century. It usually takes many years to produce that kind of, of product. Uh, frankly, we didn't have the time, right? And we wrote it uh, in conjunction with the United States Marine Corps, which if, if any, any Marines in the room, and I really need to slow down. Uh, sorry, if, 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 if you think, if you think, and the Marines will agree with this, right? If you think just because the Army and the Marines do pretty much the same thing on the same battlefield against the same enemy with the, with the same equipment, that the Army and the Marines agree on how to do anything, right? Uh, no, 
but, but we not only produced the manual in 13 months, we produced the Army Marine Corps manual in 13 months. Uh, we, we published it on December 15, 2006. It was uh, downloaded a million and a half times in the next month, translated and critiqued on jihadi websites. Copies were found in Taliban training camps in Pakistan. So we knew our enemy was reading it. We just had to get our guys to do that, right? right? <laughs> Uh, the, the process of getting our guys to read the book, read the instruction manual, uh, included getting the manual published by the University of Chicago Press. The first time an Army field manual had been published by a press in 50 years. Um, uh, actually, the first time ever an Army field manual. It was, a, it was the Marine Corps Small Wars Manual uh, that had previously been published by the University of Kansas Press 50 years earlier. Also, interestingly, uh, a, a book not about conventional war, but about irregular war, about insurgency and terror. Um, and uh, the University of Chicago, uh, God bless them, sent, uh, sent the book to The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. And for God's sake, The Daily Show with Jon Stewart uh, decided to talk about an Army Marine Corps field manual on camera. Right? The Comedy Central program. I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm not making this up. Right? And uh, um, I got a phone call. I was actually running a machine gun range at Fort Riley, Kansas, uh, asking uh, from The Daily Show asking if I would appear, this was a Monday, if I would appear on The Daily Show on Thursday to talk about the Army Marine Corps Counterinsurgency Field Manual. I said yes. I mean, obviously that wasn't, you know, being on The Daily Show wasn't even a stretch goal. Uh, and then I had to get the Army's permission to do it. So I called up the Army's Chief of Public Affairs, a two-star named Tony Kukolo, a good guy who I knew. Um, and I said, uh, hey, General Kukolo, it's John. And he said, this can't be good. Uh, <laughs> he, so as I, right as I said, he knew me. Right? And I said, hey, sir, uh, I'm going to be on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart on Thursday talking about the coin field manual. Uh, your call. I can, I can do it in uniform. You can cut me orders, and this can be an official military mission. Or I'm going to take leave and, and do it in a coat and tie. Entirely your call. While you're making that decision, uh, you, may want to, you may be interested in the fact that uh, The Daily Show is the number one news source for under 30 males, uh, uh, males age under 30 in the United States, just in case the Army has any interest in that demographic at all. <laughs> he, he told me what you probably can figure out. He told me, I won't say it in a church. Uh, <laughs> as I said, we're friends, we knew each other. Uh, and uh, I was in on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart uh, that Thursday. In uniform? In uniform. In uniform, yeah. He, he called me back the next day and said, uh, uh, "Yeah, John, uh, you know, we're, we're cutting your orders. Uh, wear your uniform and and noggle. Don't screw this up." That's close to that's that's no well, that's close that's close to what he said. Uh, and, and 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 so I did. And it, you know, you can you can Google it. It's still on YouTube. Uh, the Army actually uses it for for uh, uh, media relations uh, uh, training still today. Uh, on the plus side, just you know, not on the negative side, uh, because I had what what I am. Absolutely confident when I tell you is the funniest conversation an Army officer has ever had on camera in uniform with John Stewart on The Daily Show. <laughs> and you think that's because it's the only time it ever happened, but it's not. It's not. A general did it a couple of years later with a different book and crashed and burned. <laughs> crashed and burned. So, so they don't use that one. They use mine in the training. Um, and you don't need to buy it. It's 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 online, as I said. Um, and, and we were enormously fortunate that uh, um, a, a couple of months after it was published that Dave Petraeus was given uh, command of the war in Iraq, that uh, uh, George W. Bush made what I consider to be the bravest and the best decisions of his presidency, uh, firing his commander in Iraq, firing his Secretary of Defense, Don Rumsfeld. Any friends of Don in the room? Uh, who I considered, who, who I, I, Don doesn't have any friends, who I, I consider to be uh, you know, pretty unarguably the worst Secretary of Defense the nation has ever had. And yes, I do know McNamara. I've talked to McNamara, and Rumsfeld was worse. Um, happy, happy to talk about that in questions. And uh, also firing his commander in, in Iraq, George Casey, who was a good guy, but the wrong guy for that particular war. Uh, and, and he replaced uh, the worst Secretary of Defense we've ever had with the best SecDef we've ever had, a guy named Bob Gates, uh, about whom I can't say enough good things. Uh, and he replaced George Casey with Dave Petraeus. And Petraeus implemented the manual we'd written. And in a, a really extraordinary uh, event in military history, um, Petraeus, you know, published, published his play, called the shot, said, this is what I'm going to do, uh, and then went and did it. And in the, the 18 months uh, Petraeus was in command in Iraq, he turned that war around. Uh, violence dropped by two-thirds. Uh, the country stabilized. And, and we handed off uh, from, from George W. Bush to Barack Obama 
uh, a country that, uh, a Middle Eastern country, a big Middle Eastern country, Arab country, predominantly Arab country, that had uh, uh, a, a real chance at, at being a real democracy. Uh, it was extraordinary, extraordinary achievement. Um, uh, I'm, I'm equal opportunity. I, I said that uh, uh, George W. Bush, uh, his decision to invade Iraq was, was arguably the worst decision in the history of, of nation states. Uh, it, it's, it's right up there with, with uh, Napoleon invading Russia and, and Germany invading Russia. It's really bad, right? Uh, uh, that said, uh, equal opportunity, um, Barack Obama given the opportunity to stabilize uh, Iraq and maintain a democracy, uh, if not necessarily a liberal democracy, but a, a stable and, and improving democracy uh, in Iraq, fumbled the ball at the two-yard line, um, sort of like the Falcons, and, uh, and uh, lost, uh, uh, lost the chance to, to, to stabilize Iraq. And uh, uh, ISIS, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, took hold after, after Barack Obama prematurely pulled uh, American troops uh, out of Iraq to fulfill a campaign promise. Politicians do that sometimes. They fulfill campaign promises. That doesn't mean it's a good idea. You can talk about the current president as well uh, if, uh, doing that if you'd like to uh, tear off some of God. Um, but uh, uh, Obama fumbled the ball, and uh, we got to fight another war in Iraq uh, against uh, ISIS, and, and that war is actually going reasonably well. The broader war, uh, and I, I haven't talked to Afghanistan at all, I'm over time already, but uh, uh, happy, happy to do that in questions, but uh, um, uh, the, the war in Afghanistan um, also continues. So the sort of big picture, um, the Al-Qaeda, which attacked us on, on September 11th, has essentially been demolished, been dismantled. It has ceased to exist. It, it no longer exists. Um, its, its successor organization, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, also has ceased to exist. Uh, so so uh, uh, two strikes for those guys. Uh, ISIS, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, has, has essentially been defeated now. Uh, in, in, uh, um, certainly in Iraq, uh, Syria remains a mess and is likely to remain a mess for a long time to come. But, but the, the radical Islamic, Islamist ideology continues. And uh, um, it's essentially as if we hit, we've hit mercury with a, a, a hammer. Right, and it, it is metastasized, and we will be fighting radical Islamic extremism for the rest of the century. We will all be gone. Um, starting a year ago in a talk I gave to a bunch of, of uh, flag officers at uh, the Army War College in Carlisle, uh, I said, well, while that remains true and that challenge is not going to go away, right, great power competition, the big wars, right, is back. Right, and we can talk about why that is, but, but we, we are now in a, a, a position where having, having if, if not defeated, uh, um, mitigated, uh, severely damaged uh, uh, Islamic extremism uh, around the globe, it's going to remain, uh, but, but that, that, that cancer is broadly speaking in remission, uh, but, but great power conflict uh, with China, um, in particular, particularly disturbing with Russia, which I consider to be the greatest threat to, to world peace and stability today, uh, and, and North Korea, um, uh, a, a challenge, but, but, but uh, um, by a, a, a broken arm with reference to the cancer, um, metastasizing cancer that is Russia uh, in the world today. Um, the, the, the folks in the Department of Defense uh, in, in our, our broader national security establishment have their hands full. Uh, they are deeply challenged, gentlemen, by a president who is uninterested in the business, in, in the business of the presidency, quite frankly, but certainly in the national security responsibilities of the president, who does not understand foreign policy, does not understand the workings of his defense and national security establishment, um, and is, is overseeing uh, real damage in particular to the Department of State, which is hemorrhaging talent at, at uh, unsustainable and, and uh, deeply worrying levels. Um, uh, essentially, all, it, it would be as if all of the generals of all of our military, of, of all four of our branches, right, had all simultaneously been fired. Um, and, and in particular, with uh, um, Korea very much in the front pages, we still don't have, we, we don't even have a nominee for ambassador to South Korea. Uh, we, we have just lost our, our uh, State Department uh, um, senior expert on North Korea, 
right? And we don't have an assistant secretary of state for East Asia, which is the, the policy branch in Washington that oversees that unbelievably important part of the world. I can keep going with the, the, the dangers uh, that I see um, being created by a, a, um, an administration that, that does not, um, that, that frankly doesn't believe in government. And, and it's a real, if you got the headmaster of a boys' school, it'd be really great if he believed in education, and in particular in boys' education. It's sort of a requirement for the job. He should take it seriously and like pay attention to it, hire teachers and that sort of thing, right? And uh, we have a, an administration that is not doing those things. And, and my friends on both sides of the aisle um, are, are really, really concerned. Uh, the good news, um, if there is good news, is, is that uh, um, the president's acceptance of, of uh, uh, an invitation to meet with, the, with, with Kim Jong-un, with the North Korean leader, uh, has diminished the chances of full-scale nuclear war with North Korea, which I and many people believed was going to happen this calendar year. Right? And I was told by my friends on the National Security Council that this was the year of war with North Korea. The chances for that have diminished. Uh, as a result of the president's acceptance of, of uh, a, a meeting with Kim Jong-un. I don't believe that meeting is going to happen, but it is going to be harder for that war to proceed now. And that is at least a very good thing. Um, I, I remain unbelievably concerned about Russia uh, and its threat to American democracy, and more broadly than that, to the very Western liberal international order that has been the greatest creation of the United States and that has prevented great power war for the past 75 years. All right, and and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll close with this and, and, and go to questions if anybody uh, right, has, has, right, wants to hear me anymore. Uh, but uh, on the um, ground floor of Wilson Hall, the, the main building, beautiful old building uh, that is the core of our campus, uh, we have memorial plaques remembering the boys from the Haverford School who fell in our nation's wars. And, and in, in the First World War, the Great War, the war to end all wars, uh, which with the United States was only involved in militarily for about 18 months, from the summer of, of 17 to November 11th of, of 18, the Haverford School lost 25 boys, 25 boys dead in, in the First World War. And we didn't do it right. We did not remain engaged in the world. We did not build the, the, the structures and the systems, either domestically or internationally, that we needed. And so we got to fight World War I over again, World War I, Part II, uh, and in, in, in World War I, Part II, the Haverford School lost 75 boys. So, uh, and this was at a time when we were probably, we were graduating, that's uh, about when you were graduating, Austin, it was about 20, 20, 20, guy, 20 guys a year in the early, uh, all right, in, in the early 20th century. Um, since then, <laughs> since then, uh, so we, we lost 100 boys in the first half of the 20th century. Since then, in the nearly 75 years since, the Haverford School has lost three boys in our nation's wars. Right. From 100 to three. There's a number of reasons for that, but the, the primary reason, I believe, has been the, the international structures, including the, the, the military, the intelligence community, the State Department uh, that the United States has built. Our, our friends and allies around the globe have essentially made the world safe for little wars, like the wars I've spent much of my career studying and fighting. Right? That system, that structure is under threat and is being dismantled primarily by the United States. And so the chances of Desert Storm kind of wars or bigger is back. And so I end as I began with the prospect of tank wars, of big wars recurring, but with no guarantee that the outcome will be as successful for the United States as Operation Desert Storm was. So on that cheery note, gentlemen, any questions? <laughs> Scott, sure, Into go ahead. Iraq. to sell that based on German intelligence not allowing Colin Powell to interview the operative they nicknamed Curveball. Yeah, um, so I'm a big Powell fan. Yeah, um, so I'm a big Powell fan. 
Um, you, you really don't need your Secretary of State interviewing individual intelligence sources. That's not what we want the Secretary of State to do. After, after September 11th, the President of the United States should have fired his, his uh, uh, cabinet officer, his CIA director, George Tenet. Cabinet officers exist to be fired by the President of the United States when their cabinet agency fails at a catastrophic level. The September 11th attacks were a catastrophic intelligence failure by the CIA. Uh, George Tenet was not fired by the President of the United States. He knew he should have been. He became a lapdog of George W. Bush as a result. President George W. Bush very much wanted to go to war with Iraq. Uh, he, was, he was assisted in this by, among others, Paul Wolfowitz, who later became Deputy Secretary of Defense. Um, and and there, are, there are interesting Freudian reasons for that, right? I mean, uh, literally, he tried to kill my dad, right? It was one of George W. Bush's answers for why we were going to go to war with Iraq <laughs> after the attacks of September 11th. And so the intelligence agencies right, gave the president what he wanted to hear right, at the direction of George Tenet rather than the truth. Colin Powell believed, honestly believed, uh, clearly honestly believed, the, the intelligence that he was given. He, he very unusually went over to, to CIA headquarters and did a bunch of the primary source reading. He didn't trust what he was being given. Right? He believed that Tenet was in thrall to the president and the president's desires to fight this war. But he, he and he saw the holes, but, but he, he, he's the Secretary of State. He didn't have time to pull them all, all, all out. Uh, he did insist that Tenet be sitting behind him. He picked the seat so that Tenet, if you look at the camera, uh, the, the camera angles, when, when Powell was talking before the UN Security Council, Tenet is, is in the camera picture continuously. Right, so, so Powell wanted Tenet to have paint on his hands for that talk. Uh, I believed that Powell was right and that Hussein, that Hussein had WMD. Who, who, I, I didn't have access to the intelligence. Who am I to doubt Colin Powell? But I still argued at the time that the fact that Saddam had WMD was no reason to go to war with Iraq. Right? We have lived for 65 years or so right, with a, a regime that has WMD that is pointed at us right, and that has stated, we will bury you. Right? That has been in a state of cold war with us for many years. I refer, of course, to the Soviet Union and then to Russia. Uh, deterrence works. So even if Saddam had WMD, that was no reason to go to war with him in the same way that even if Kim Jong-un has WMD and ICBMs that can hit us, that does not mean we need to go to war with him. Deterrence works. If you launch on the United States, your country will be turned to obsidian glass. Everybody knows that. Nobody wants their country to turn into obsidian glass. Right? And, and so even if Powell was right, which it turns out he wasn't, and I've explained why a little bit, there was no reason to go to war with Saddam Hussein in 2003. But if we were going to do it, we should have done it a whole lot better than we did. Right? I mean, we, we picked the date and the time, and we were still completely and totally unready. Yeah, so, so North Korea is playing a very bad hand very well. Uh, the United States is playing a very good hand very badly. Um, uh, uh, a summit with the President uh, of the United States comes at the end of a process, not at the beginning. And, and in particular, for the President of the United States to publicly meet with the head of a pariah regime that starves and, and, and kills its own people, uh, and, and, and that, that acts provocatively, that, that tests ICBMs over one of our, 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 not one of our, our closest ally in the Pacific, Japan, uh, that, that has an active nuclear program. Um, that's an extraordinary reward. That's what Kim Jong-un wants. That gives him legitimacy in his own country, in the region, and around the globe. Every ruler in the world would love a summit with the President of the United States. You don't give that for free. That's one of the things you put on the table at the end. Right? 
that the president gave it first is an unbelievable misreading of diplomacy, history, strategy, I can keep going. And what you saw yesterday was an unbelievable backpedaling right, by, um, by the White House uh, saying that this was another thing the president didn't mean. Uh, he didn't, they, they haven't said that he was joking, uh, although I expect that to come out soon. The, the, the disconnect right, with, with his own Secretary of State, who, who, who the same day the president announced this was going to happen, uh, Rex Tillerson, uh, his beleaguered uh, and unfortunate Secretary of State, said there's no way, we're not even close to, to, to opening talks with North Korea, much less to what happens at the end of talks, of years of talks, having the President of the United States right, engage in a summit with the leader of that pariah regime. Um, I can keep going on how bad it is, uh, the good, but, but as I said, the good news is uh, that the president has agreed to that, does make nuclear war with North Korea much less likely. And that's really good for everybody, but in particular for Seoul, which is in conventional artillery range of, of, uh, of uh, a not particularly capable military force in North Korea, but one that could kill literally a million people with conventional artillery in the first day of, of conflict um, in Seoul. Uh, which would, uh, um, there's, there's a bunch of better businessmen in, in the room than me. Um, the, the loss of Seoul would be, a, uh, right, there'd be a lot of money in reconstruction, I guess, but, but the immediate damage to the world economy would be extraordinary, it'd be a global recession. Um, so the, the good news is that that war is less likely, and, 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 and literally, right, a, a, a senior National Security Council official told me in December that the next year we're going to see war with North Korea. Uh, I probably take more credit than I should for, for the counterinsurgency manual. The, I was sort of the managing editor of the project. The guy who, the, the real editor of the project was a guy named Conrad Crane. Con, a retired army colonel, history professor, PhD from Stanford maybe. Um, West Point classmate of Dave Petraeus. Um, and, and Con, before the war in Iraq, published, he was a professor at the Army War College, uh, published a, a paper at the Army War College that said, hey, if we invade Iraq, uh, the, the Sunnis, who are the, uh, a majority, a minority of the population, but uh, Saddam was a Sunni, uh, the, the, the Sunnis have almost all of the political power in Iraq. Uh, there, there's a whole lot of pent-up frustration among the Shia. If, if we invade Iraq and, and impose democracy or majority rule, the Shia will be in power, the Sunnis won't like that, and there will be an insurgency inside Iraq. I mean, he called the ball, right? Published it in the Army War College, so of course nobody read it. And, and uh, um, we absolutely, not, not only should we have seen it coming, we did see it coming. So one of the ironies of the counterinsurgency field manual project is that the guys who, guys and, and women, but mostly guys who wrote it, uh, were all to a human, right? Uh, opposed to the invasion of Iraq in 2003, said we shouldn't do this, but now that we've done it, felt compelled to help, help the U.S. pick up the pieces. Um, and, and many of us uh, really, really driven to do that because so many of our friends had been killed and injured. So, um, there was, there was um, very little understanding of the Sunni-Shia dynamic uh, um, inside the, the senior levels of the Department of Defense. A man named Larry Dorita, was uh, the press secretary for the Pentagon, Don Rumsfeld's press secretary, but in a way was, was almost, uh, it was a little bit like Ivanka is, is now. Uh, so so what, what, what Ivanka is to the president, Larry was to, to Don Rumsfeld in the Pentagon, and, and Don sent, sent uh, Larry uh, over to Iraq, uh, and this was, this was just prior to the invasion. There was a dinner of, of uh, uh, the, the organization uh, Reconstruction and Humanitarian Assistance, maybe whatever the, the organization that was going to take over after, after Saddam fell. Uh, the, the, they were having dinner. It's, it's February 2003. We're about to invade. And Larry Dorita says at dinner, at this dinner of, of the folks who are going to be responsible for picking up the pieces of Iraq, says, we're, America is going to be home by Christmas. The table went silent, and somebody said, what year, Larry? <laughs> uh, and, 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 and the answer is not in this century. Not in this century, right? So there were people who knew, and there were people in charge, and it's a bad thing when the people who are in charge don't know. 
right? And, and, and I've got to say, there, 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 are, there is exactly one country in the world that could survive a mistake on the order of magnitude of Iraq and still be the world's still be a great power, much less the world's greatest power, and it's the United States. But the, uh, about 25% uh, uh, about of, of our debt as a nation that we've acquired over 240 years, right, about one quarter of it is as a result of the war in Iraq. Five trillion dollars or so, six trillion dollars or so. And there's more coming. It's a, the, 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 the order of magnitude of this mistake is, is uh, and only the United States could absorb this, this mistake and, and keep going, but we've got more mistakes <coughs> coming. I one thing I've been confused about <coughs> in recent one years, and even about today in your speech, we talk years, about and even the war in Iraq, in speech, mm -hmm. the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, and the war when in the real issue is the war on terror. When the real issue is the war on terror. So why don't we hear so from our leadership and a strategy in the talk here from about our leadership and a strategy how we're going to survive the war on terror and extremism how we're going to survive the war talk about on terror and extremism rather than keeping the focus on about about the war in Iraq rather than keeping the focus on yeah. the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan yeah the the immediate challenge is radical islamic extremism that is adhered to by a, a significant minority of muslims probably no more than a couple of percent globally, uh, but uh, much higher than that in particular in Saudi Arabia, which is the center of radical Islamic extremism. Saudi Arabia? Yeah. Saudi Arabia? If, if we wanted to invade the country that was responsible for the attacks on, of September 11th, that country is Saudi Arabia? 15 of the 19 hijackers came from Saudi Arabia? The funding for this war comes from Saudi Arabia? And so does our oil. And you know who is providing the funding for the radical Islamic extremists? You. You and your wives and your daughters are driving the Range Rovers to drop my boys off at the Haverford School. Right? That's who is funding this war. That is a very unpopular thing to say. Why, that, why are they doing that? Why is who doing it? Why, why are, are, are funding this war? Because the people of Saudi Arabia, the, the population of Saudi Arabia, are radical Islamic extremists. They, they believe in the caliphate. They want Islam, a very, a, a very uh, 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 radical form of Islamic law to rule the entire Islamic world. Wow. Okay? The Sharia law. Yeah. Right? The, the, a very large percentage of the population in Saudi Arabia. Were there to be an election in Saudi Arabia, it would become it would be ruled by Sharia law, wow. right? It would, it, would be the cent, it, it, would, it would be a pariah state. Interestingly, were there to be an election in Iran, the, the government that would be elected would, would be more moderate than the current government of the United States of America. If there were a democracy, yeah, they would elect a government that became a state sponsor of terror. Currently, the, the government has some degree of plausible deniability. All the money that's funding the jihad, the global jihad, is coming from Saudi Arabia. Government of Saudi Arabia is not personally writing the checks its population is. Now, it, it is providing the money to write those checks through distribution of the oil revenues, which it provides to the people of Saudi Arabia, which come from us. So we are funding the war against us. Right, I, I killed, I, my guys killed, I, I usually, you know, sucked my thumb and, and wet myself on the floor of my tank, but my guys killed or captured 600 out of the 300 insurgents, right? <laughs> and, and at the end of the year, there were more there than there were when we'd started, right? We can't kill our way out of this. There's a billion plus Muslims in the world, right? If 2% of them are radical Islamic extremists funded by Saudi Arabia, we can't kill them all. We have to get rid of the madrasas, the, the, the radical Islamic schools that litter our good friends, the Pakistanis. Right? And, 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 and we have to do international development in places like Somalia and Yemen, where, where the, this, this radical Islamic extremism has metastasized, funded by the good people, our good friends, the Saudis, the Saudi people. Right? And, and so to win this war, 
we have to triple and then triple again the size of our State Department and the U.S. Agency for International Development. The, the very organizations that are currently being gutted by this administration. It would be hard to be more ass backwards than our strategy currently is. And there's a reason I'm the headmaster of the Haverford School rather than banging my head against walls in Washington right now. I can't guarantee that will always be the case, but right now there's not a lot of good I can do down there. Sort of like the 17 kids getting killed in, in Parkland being required for Florida to do a couple of really common sense things. How many kids have to get killed before we figure out that we need to stop funding the own, our own war against us and stop cutting the dollars, the most effective dollars in aid and development to, to ending this war in 25 years rather than in 125 years. On that cheery note, I, I, I can stick around if anybody wants to. Thank you so much, John. A lot to think about. Thank you so Thanks. much, John. You're really great.